very much for this opportunity. Um, I have to continue doing work with stu with young scholars like Yuma Desser, um, putting out work and material all, all, seemingly all the time. So I've got to make certain I'm ready to go or else you're going to catch me. Um, famous American baseball player said, don't look back in the rearview mirror. Someone might be gaining. And you and your colleagues have done so with the excellent training you've received. Um, I'm from Kumar Asami. And I should, um, as you're getting this up, I should warn my German friend, I sometimes speak a bit ganz schnell, so I'll do my best to keep up um, with, uh, try to keep it a little slower with that. Do we have the other slide up? I'm, I'm, yes, I guess so, yes. Great. Perfect. Well, give, give it a moment, we'll do that. And again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and your colleagues. Again, I've been extraordinarily impressed by the work that comes out of India. It has enriched my work. Um, and I've had Kumar Sami speak to my classes multiple times, and they've always been um, extraordinarily um, insightful, and I've learned things. I have another piece I'll be coming, working on about Asia's ties with the Gulf states, um, which in part will deal with India. Um, my, my colleagues don't know enough about India, and every time I talk to you and to your colleagues, I learn more every time. Um, do we have the PowerPoint I, up yet, I, or is that? I think I think the PowerPoint is up. Can you can you see it? I can't see it, but I'm going to go ahead and trust that it's um, that it's there. Should I go ahead and start? Yeah, please. Okay. When I was in Great Britain for a friend's wedding in October 2012, I spent an extra day in London to see hashtag Come Together an exhibit of contemporary Saudi artists held at Brick Lane in East London. Since my wife and I would be spending the next year in Riyadh, I hope that the exhibit could prepare me for my time there. It was a life-changing decision for me, altering how I understand Saudi Arabia, while providing with me with a core intellectual framework for changing Saudi Arabia, art, culture and society in the kingdom. My book published by Lynn Reiner Press and distributed by Viva Publishers in India. I wish to give a shout out to both of those. At the time of the exhibit, the dramatic reforms that we've witnessed over the last four years in Saudi Arabia are still several years away. But the men and the women whose works were on display in London had started to imagine what a future kingdom might look like a country where women might drive and other cultural and social reforms might be implemented. The title that they chose for their exhibit reflected this their spirit of reimagining. Hashtag come together. It evokes realism, but in a fresh way for a new generation by Twitter hashtag. While female activists had staged public driving protests to spark a dialogue on gender, these artists took a different route to talk about sensitive issues. Instead of insisting on one point of view, they made co collages and other types of work that displayed many perspectives, including contradictory ones. Several of the works tied Saudi aesthetics and social religious traditions the global ones as diverse as Asian calligraphy, excellent, cubism, film, and hip hop. Shall we get to the third slide so we can get to where we were? Excellent, again, thank you for getting this up. Technical difficulties um, always work. Here we go, that one will be great. We can get there. Okay, you, are we got to the third slide yet? Yeah, it's a bit slow. Yeah, I, I yeah. All right, let me keep on going. We could get to the fourth one. That would be great, because that's going to be one they'll need to see. Hip hop art following the director of the Beatles song, they come together right now. <clears throat> I was intrigued by the aesthetics of these works and the perspective and questions that they raised about issues central to my own scholarship um, of, of the kingdom. This was a vision of culture very different from mine in America. It presented dialogue as an entity in motion. They were always open to interpretation and reinterpretation by others, nor was the discussion about art limited to the gallery in London. 
viewers were asked to make comments on social media using the exhibition title, which again was a Twitter hashtag, come together, hashtag come together. All right, we got, you want to get to four? So I can get, I'll be talking about that one for a minute. Yeah, I've tried to pick it up, but somehow there's something. It's taking a minute. Problem. All right, I'll, I'll do my best. We'll come back to, we'll get. No piece in the exhibit was more thought provoking than Ahmed Mattar's The Cowboy Code, Hadith. The work, which is 415 by 800, um, 800 meters, excellent. Yes. Excellent, there we go. Okay. Can you all, I assume everyone can see that. Excellent. Yes. Or 163 by 315 inches occupies a vast canvas composed of thousands of red plastic toy gun caps, combining two entities that few people would see as anything in common or even coexisting in the same space. One entity gives Mater the first piece of his title, The Cowboy Code. In the late 1940s, the popular American singer, Gene Autry, issued a formal code of ethics for his fans, most of whom were children. It was called Gene Autry's Cowboy Code, or the Cowboy Commandments, of which you can see there are 10. These commanded included injunctions such as the cowboy should never shoot first, hit a smaller man, or take unfair advantage, and he must be gentle with the animals, the elderly, and animals, children, elderly animals. The second entity, which you see on the other side, is the Wasiya al-Islam al-Har, Islam's Ten Commandments in War, which are attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. This code explains the second part of the piece's title, hadith, the term that Muslims use to refer to the statements and actions of the Prophet Muhammad. And a handout provided by the organizers of Hashtag Come Together, Matar explained that as a child, he often played cowboy with toy guns that shot the type of caps that he used in the piece. As I sought to come to terms with Matar's paradoxical work, I remembered Said Kutub, the Islamic intellectual who knew Autry's music and mid-century America well. Between 1948 and 1950, Kutub lived, as you can see there, in Greeley, Colorado, right in the middle of the United States, where he familiarized himself with the nation's society, including what he characterized as America's primitive tastes in art and music. Over the next two decades, he became disillusioned with the whole of American art and culture, and in 1964, wrote Milestones, a book whose ideas inspired scores of Muslims to wage violent jihad against America and its allies in the Middle East. In Kutub's worldview, the cowboy code, Hadith, makes little sense. It might even be seen as offensive, since the work places a code written by an American movie star in the mid 20th century on the same plane as revered holy works of Islam's prophet. But as I looked more intensely at the cowboy code hadith, it was clear to me that Mata had developed a perspective and a provocative answer to Kutub. There are phrases in the piece, some in Arabic, some in English, with similar meanings, which are side by side with one another. For example, there is the English phrase, a cowboy respects womanhood, and in Arabic next to it, there is he advised that you should never kill a woman, not kill a woman. By juxtaposing these phrases, Matar asked the viewer to ponder whether America's cultural collision with Islam, including one composed of toy gun caps, can produce something other than discord, namely coexistence and the emergence of common values. For Matar, this was a profound proposal. Not only had many Saudi men his age revered Kutub's book, but Matar and his compatriots had lived for over a decade in the shadow of the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, one of the worst examples of cultural collision in the 21st century. Upon reflection, I realized that Matar's willingness to raise the questions showed that he and his fellow artists could negotiate context that Westerners and even some Middle Easterners view as being in a state of tension, even to the point of contradiction. But these artists see such context as part of the many faces 
of reality. It was clear to me that this vision allows such artists to express sophisticated opinions in a way that is different from the state society dynamic and the other dualistic structures that my colleagues and I had used for decades to describe Saudi Arabia. What I discovered in East London was a grassroots social discourse, one that reflected a cross section of Saudi public opinion, drew on foreign and domestic sources and explored the present and possible futures, futures of the kingdom. Are we to the next slide yet? Or are we still getting there? Yeah, I guess I can go. Yeah, one more? Yeah, there we go, yeah. There we go, excellent. The book that emerged out of that realization and that I'll talk about today, Changing Saudi Arabia, Art, Culture, and Society in the Kingdom, investigates this discourse while also seeking to reframe how we look at Saudi Arabia. Building on my extensive research online and throughout the kingdom, I argue that, Saudi, that Saudis articulate, these artists articulate the feelings and experiences that the country's masses cannot easily express. To, elevate, to paraphrase Ezra Pound, Saudi artists are the antennae of the kingdom's society, whose work is not near self-expression, but in the words of Marshall McLuhan, the distant early warning system that can always be relied upon to tell the old culture what is beginning to happen to it. By investigating the work of Saudi artists, we can get a fresh vision of Saudi society today while starting to transcend the old dualistic frameworks long used to understand the country. Frameworks which Edward Said, in his book, Orientalism, widely, wisely argued that we should avoid. Ultimately, changing Saudi Arabia helps us understand how Saudi artists can be prophetic and see the future and reveal key social debates that are not as easily visible in other forms of political and social analysis. For years, observers largely overlooked Saudi Arabia's art, culture, and society, assuming that there was no way that a viable creative class could exist, no less flourish there. In their eyes, Saudis are an intolerant and inward looking people, you can see with that denial of internet request you can see there, who seek to preserve their cultural and religious traditions Against, of, against art and any other manifestation of the contemporary world, a view sometimes reinforced by some Saudis. For instance, the man that you see there, Abdus Salam al Wael, writing in the Saudi Arabic newspaper Al Shark, noted If we can see that there's a Saudi culture and it has value, we can also say with high confidence that the contempt for the arts lies at the heart of its values. In other words, there's no art here. Such comments not only present a narrow definition of the country's culture and society, but also overlook the impact that the artistic movement had already had by the time he wrote that article in 2013. That movement began during the 2000s in Asir. You can see Asir in the south of the country. It's in that red box that you can see there. And it's on the border with Yemen, southern border with Yemen, and it's a place few foreigners visit, but where I was able to conduct extensive research including at al Watan newspaper and at al Miftaha, an enormous complex that provides studio art space to the community. Prince Khalid al Faisal, Asir's governor between 1971 and 2007, created the two institutions as part of a program to combat extremism, especially after two Asiris, two people from this region, Wa'al al Shahri and Walid al Shahri, participated in the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Strikingly, shortly after the attack, Abdel Nasser Garam, a commando in the Saudi army, who ironically had actually been a high school classmate of the al Shafris, was introduced to Matar and another group of young men at a Miftaha, none of whom had any training in the arts, by Jamal Khashoggi. <laughs> at the time, Khashoggi was editor of al Watan and a strong supporter of the arts and al Miftaha in particular. As I discuss in detail in the second chapter of my book, Garam, Matar, and the other young men formed a majlis, or form for group discussion, to talk about both art and its role in the world. 
using the internet, which had been introduced to the kingdom just a few years earlier. They gathered many articles and books together as they could online and shared it among themselves. Out of these discussions, which eventually expanded to include women, there emerged a new model for creating art. I guess we're still a little behind on the slides. That's true. Yeah, we'll get to that. One that synthesized art from home and abroad, explored cultural and social issues, drew extensively from the online world, and created a new common social space. Rather than utilizing a Western framework in which a Western in which an artist works in a studio and his or her own, creating art as God created the world, they envisioned a process where the artist, the matchless, which they're part of the sort of circle of people talking to each other, and society, through the gallery of art and other ways, had roles in defining art. Indeed, a Saudi art critic told me during an interview that Matar and his colleagues in the Majlis allowed others to read into their own work what they want, to have their own say, so to speak. A critical part of that process was ambiguity, for it offered these artists a mechanism to explore sensitive topics while still claiming that the work of, their, of a particular artist or their particular work was nonpartisan. Um, should I... Okay, are we going to get, ah, excellent. Thank you, Modesto. I understand technical issue, issues happen over these things. These things happen. And again, I want to pause for a second. You can see there's the modulus there. You can see the men there with the water pipe. That's Garam on the one on the far left, on the far left on his own. Mothra is on the other side of him. And you can see sort of this idea I talk about ambiguity. If you look at Mothra's evolution of man, and I should note, Mothra was an emergency room physician before becoming an artist. And you can see on that picture of, and again, you can tell, is he reading from right to left or left to right? Is he talking about suicide? Is he talking maybe about the role of oil in the country? What is he talking about in that context? Again, he's using ambiguity there um, in that context. In interviews with me, artists like Matra and others stressed that they were not picking sides. Instead, they were trying to be a mirror to society. But that did not mean that artists did not want their work to generate a reaction and to bring about social change. Sometimes when you become a mirror as an artist and you show your society who they are, Abdel Nasser Garam has noted, they get upset. Both his work and that of other artists such as Matar's wife, Ara al Naimi, has touched on sensitive topics and provoked intense reactions at times from society, just as they would have hoped. As they repeatedly told me, their aim is to get people to wake up, to react, <laughs> as Garam likes to say. Um, and you can see they're with the shisha. Do we have the, okay, excellent. You can see two examples of this work here. One is Garam's prosperity without growth. And you can see the picture there, the figure on the throne or seat that's there is actually divided. On one side, you have him wearing the cloak of a Shia cleric, and on the other side of a Sunni cleric. Again, this is suggesting sectarian divisions within Saudi Arabia. You can also see religious and other things. Other things might be implied as well. Al Naami's Never Never Land is a, a, a series of pictures and a video that we'll have sent out to you afterwards. And that's actually taken in an amusement park in southern Saudi Arabia called Never Never Land. The pictures were done in 2013 before women were allowed to drive. You can see these are women in Saudi Arabia driving bumper cars. What does that say? And why would she do it at a, a place called Never Never Land? Sort of remarkable thing. And she got enormous reactions, you can imagine. With that. Okay, can we go into the next slide? We could get that to her. Excellent, perfect. By the early 2010s, the model pioneered by Garam and his peers had been adopted by a second generation of artists who explored the same questions that the artists had in Asir, but through a stand-up comedy, social media, video, social media, and videos uploaded to Saudi, to YouTube, on special channels that effectively became a new form of television. You can see one there on the left, U-turn. Although the comedy shows and videos, which I discussed in the final part of my book, reached a wider audience than the artists had in Asir, this new generation continued to trust others to assign meaning to their work, 
as Omar Hussein, an early star of this generation, observed, Saudi humor reflects something that is happening in our community in a comical manner. And it's up to you to decide what's right or what's wrong. But as director and stand-up comedian Ali Kathami has noted, Saudi comedy and online videos isn't just back and forth. The viewer is asked to critique and to question rather than passively receive. If you're not a thinker, director Malik Nudger noted to me, you are not a good artist. After all, he added during one of our interviews, I do change through everything of what I do everywhere. And Nodger and his colleagues have more than lived up to this ambitious motto, with both videos and social media accounts that are among the most important in the kingdom, both in the number of followers and in their active engagement. As I discussed in the final part of the book, the second generation of artists has played a key role in the debates on gender um, and the ban on women driving, along with other issues that are not as well known, but are nonetheless important. While the Saudi government and its officials like to say that there is no racism in the kingdom, Mississippi Ibrahim, who you see here performing, Holland Moss, and other dark-skinned Saudi comedians reference discrimination in their jokes and the things that some Saudis will do to improve their job and social prospects, such as using special whitening creams, a process often called skin, um, skin bleaching, something I'm sure you're familiar with here in India. To illustrate the importance of these jokes, um, I open my book's chapter on stand-up comedy with a story that Holland Moss, you see here, told me about his audition in 2012 for a Rhea production company that produces vast stand-up comedy shows in the kingdom. He began his audition by referencing the Saudi woman who had preceded him in the audition, a singer whose skin was so fair that it could be seen as racially white by Saudis. So he began by saying this, I don't know if you just are bad or did something sufficiently bad that God is cursing you. Mm. How else could you be unlucky enough to have a black man follow a white woman with a beautiful voice? He then delivered a brief series of jokes, some of which touched on race in Saudi Arabia. Moss closed by noting that if he failed the audition, he would just hang out with the company's security guard who was also a Saudi of Sudanese ancestry, again, with dark skin, until the whitening cream had had its intended effect. The reaction was a hearty laughter from the judges, signaling that Moss had passed his audition with flying colors. Eight years after the audition, the joke that Moss made about skin whitening creams and the racial hierarchies that they, pr that they promote remains relevant in Saudi Arabia and the wider world, including India. In response to mass protests about police brutality and racism following the death of George Floyd in the United States, Unilever recently announced that it's dropping the word fair from its fair and lovely brand and also eliminating any references to the cream's whitening or lightening effects. Other multinationals, and again, as I'm sure you know, there are many of them, have announced similar changes to their skin whitening cream. The speed and depth of these changes to, prom to prominent fans, brands have, have surprised many observers, but they were consistent with the jokes that Moss had made for years, illustrating the depth of his insights into Saudi society, and by the way, to the wider world. Along with the wisdom of Ezra Pound and Marshall McLuhan's vision of arts as a prophetic force rather than individual self-expression. Indeed, I framed the introduction to my book around a quotation in which McLuhan hails the arts as a type of early alarm system that provides us with ample time to prepare for social change. Nor am I the only one to realize the power of Saudi Arabia's artists in the kingdom and the wider world. Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, often known as MBS, has referenced the country's artists in his speeches while incorporating them into Vision 2030. His initiative announced in 2016 to reform the country's economy and its society. Today, Saudi Arabia's creative class looked to culture as a vehicle for transforming society from the bottom up, an approach that relies on faith in persuasion rather than toppling power structures, looking to arts rather than violence or salvation. 
The strategy, I argue, in my conclusion, has been successful because they reject a central tenet of Western history and of Western modernity, namely that tribalism should be abandoned in favor of individualism. That has been a critical choice for tribalism and religion are viewed with suspicion by many intellectuals in the West and in other parts of the world. Yet individualism has its weaknesses just as tribal and religion have their strengths. The latter, in fact, even addresses some problems inherent in the former, such as the lonely crowd. The people I discuss in, their, in this book wish to maintain key elements of tribalism while functioning in the contemporary world where individualism is often paramount. This paradox provides a lesson, a powerful lesson for observers of Saudi society and politics in the 21st century. If we limit our focus to the people who are most visible and at the forefront of society of government, like Khaled al-Fala that you see here, we are likely to miss the ideas of the instrumental creators who build many other things. Culture and mass opinion are shaped by the art that a society generates, although this process often occurs outside of public view without explicit assertions. As Garam has said, people need to listen to the artist. He and other artists perhaps aspire to be, to use the famous English poet Pierce Shelley's phrase, the unacknowledged legislators of their country. They begin by bringing the complex issues into the spotlight of art and of laughter. Thank you. Yeah.